So I was leading a tour of the uh, Digibarn Computer Museum, I think, what was it, about a year and a half ago? And uh, thanks to this young lady here, uh, she brought along uh, Severo Ornstein, who's sitting right here. And he, he was very polite, because here I am giving my tour sort of through the, the timeline of the museum, and I, I go past the Alto, and I talk about uh, talk about it. I go past the Altair and talk about it. And uh, he um, politely listens and, and I keep going. We go up the stairs. We talk about the birth of graphical interface in the 70s. The birth of the concept of personal computing uh, in the 70s. And at the very end of the tour, uh, Severo says, excuse me, um, but, but have you heard of the link? And my foggy brain which has been mainly focused on computing since 1970-72, goes back and clicks and, okay, college course, computer science, 1982. Yeah, there was a machine called LNIC, and I said, sort of. Didn't want to seem like a complete idiot, which I, of course I was at that moment, about the link. And uh, then he proceeded to describe the link and said that he'd uh, written a book about it. And my, eye, my sort of eyes got wide. I immediately... Uh, rushed off and actually if somebody can hit next slide on the hit the space bar there would be fine I rushed off to the internet and bought his book called Computing in the Middle Ages <laughs> and uh, it's just a great book and read it cover to cover and thought oh my god this is a tremendous innovation from a time period that for me because I wasn't focused on that collectively and Gordon can I imprinted on later things right Gordon the nomograph uh, Gordon Bell over here had come up with this concept that you imprint, generations imprint on certain machines and they don't really know what happened before. So I got re-imprinted on this machine and for me it was a big eye-opener and as we got to become friends and visited, uh, I sort of thought, gee, it would be really great to do an event on the link as part of the DigiBarns annual big anniversary thing because the purpose of our anniversary events is to bring something that is lesser known back and give it a full treatment. And I, I, I honor Jeff Raskin in this and then I say it's filling the holes in the histories. He, he wrote an essay called that. You're going to fill the holes in these histories. We can do that. And so lo and behold one day Severo writes a bunch of the guys at this table an email saying so um, if we try to do something with a link, do you guys know of any source? And this is, I'll, I'll let uh, Severo give you more, uh, more background, but it turns out there were four of them parked in a garage in St. Louis. Four units. Sort of a magic number. You can probably get one working if you have four. That was the concept. And so from that point on, it became a possibility that the next year, and it would turn out to be the 45th anniversary, and my 45th year on this planet, so I sort of like, I grew up with the link, but I didn't know it existed. Um, um, anyway, and I'm starting to show wear and tear myself. My tape drives don't work very well either. Uh, anyway, so it became a possibility, and throughout the year of, say, starting around the fall of last year, it became more and more of a possibility, and the guys actually started to look, and they, they concluded, and I won't take, steal their thunder, that they could get a machine working. And so then we went into logistics mode. We contacted Gordon and said, guess what? And Gordon had just sent an email out to uh, a list here at the museum about, what it, we gotta do something about the link because there's one here. And I said, guess what? There's one in the middle of the country that is probably gonna be restorable. And he got all excited. And Gordon provided sort of key support, key logistical and uh, inspirational support to actually allow us to imagine trucking the thing out here. Uh, and that's why it's sitting in the next room. And uh, so without further introduction, because there's a lot more real juice coming here, uh, I'll hand it over to Severo, but I just want to say thank you for, in advance, for everybody who's just worked incredibly hard to make this happen. And I will say it, and I know it's controversial, but I think of the link as the first personal computer. And I'll probably make some closing remarks if there's no arrows sticking out of, out of here. But uh, So Severo, will you 
you want to take it from here and I'll go and run the slides. We old folks stay seating. <clears throat> I need to explain. This is uh, my wife when I told her that I was going to do this. That uh, she, uh, I told my wife I was going to do this and uh, that I needed a timer, of course, to time these folks. And she said, you don't need a timer, you need a hook. And so that's what this is about. And uh, it's too bad this carpet is so soft. It doesn't make much noise. Anyway, I want to thank Bruce for uh, bringing us all together. He thinks that we came here to, uh, to do this show. We actually came here to see one another. We haven't seen one another together for uh, 40 years. We don't want to think how long it's been. But um, in any event, we're glad to see you all here. Uh, I know about half the audience in this place, it looks like, maybe a third. Um, I guess the question that uh, I, I wanted to avoid the, uh, what Bruce just said, the uh, business of the first personal computer, uh, you can get hung up in the semantics and uh, forever. So we're not going to talk about that, we're just going to talk about the, uh, the link itself for the most part. Certainly the Alto uh, is the first machine that would be recognizable by people who are using computers on their desks at home these days uh, as having a very similar facade. The, uh, it's the first machine with a, that a large number of people used that had the uh, graphical user interface that we all know and love or hate today. But um, what Bruce didn't know was that uh, many years earlier, back in the early 60s, that uh, we had in fact built the, uh, built the link. And it was really entirely uh, Wes's idea. Uh, the rest of us were hangers-on and uh, liked the idea, but uh, the, the, the trouble that we're going to have today is in some senses resetting all of you to the early 1960s because the link really did, in, in my mind, represent a major uh, shift in the way people viewed computers. Up until that time, the machines had been really large, expensive, and it was, it was just accepted that they would be that and, and that they, therefore they needed to be shared. And at that time, uh, time sharing was being explored, starting to be explored uh, on the theory, theory that these machines would forever be expensive and that you needed to figure out how to share them. Actually, out of time sharing has come some uh, multiprocessing techniques that, that are, uh, you, exist in your computers at home. But uh, prior to that, uh, you know, people arrived with their decks of cards. It, it was not too many years before that the transistor was invented. It's really hard to realize how many things took place in a hurry back during that period. In any event, uh, West decided that we should uh, just simply uh, build an existence proof that you could build a small machine that could be used interactively cheaply enough so that it could be dedicated to a single person. And I think that that probably is the, th the thing that primarily uh, characterizes the link. It's the most important thing about it. It was really a break with the notion that you had to share large machines. Um, let's see, I seem to have three minutes left. I'm going to tell a story. It's about communication. And uh, it has to do with the Pope. And a few hundred years ago, the Pope, it seems, uh, declared that the Jews had to leave Italy. And the Jews, of course, didn't like this, so they got together and complained, and the Pope said, well, okay, i tell you what, uh, we'll have a debate. You guys select your favorite rabbi, and uh, he and I'll have a debate. And if I win, you guys got to leave, and if he wins, you get to stay. So they did, and uh, they got together, but then it turned out that the rabbi didn't speak Italian and the Pope didn't speak Hebrew. So they, uh, they sat there in chairs facing one another, and the Pope raised three fingers. And the rabbi raised one finger. And then the uh, Pope circled around his head, like this, and the rabbi pointed at the ground. And then the Pope brought out the chalice and the uh, wafer, and uh, the rabbi brought out an apple. Whereupon the Pope stood up and said, you win. Uh, I give up, you can stay. So then the cardinals gathered around the Pope and said, what happened? How did this, what happened? And he said, well, you know, I raised one finger to, uh, or three fingers to indicate the, the Holy Trinity, and he raised one finger to remind me that uh, there was one God between us. And uh, then I uh, circled my head to show that uh, 
the uh, God was everywhere and he said yes but God's right here too with us and so I then pulled out the, the uh, wine and the wafers to say that uh, you know we uh, God forgives us for our sins and he pulled out the apple to say that well sins are still with us and uh, so then the, the rabbi was queried by his friends and uh, they said uh, how did you win and he said beats me I got no clue and uh, he said you know he said you got three days to leave and I said uh, I gave him the finger <laughs> and uh, then uh, then he said we're gonna round you up and get you out of here and I said we're staying right here and uh, somebody asked well what happened then And he said well he pulled out his lunch so so did I <laughs> I hope we do a little better with communicating this afternoon than that. Um, it's really very hard to put yourself back where, uh, where things were in the 1960s and to imagine we're so accustomed to the notion that computers are tiny and small and, and we carry them around with us and so forth these days. But it really was quite a major break then. Okay, well I've used up almost all my time and it's now time to introduce these uh, these solids. We're going to have two sections in this today. Uh, the first section we're going to talk about the link itself and its history and uh, some of the applications. And uh, then we're going to switch over to the other team on the other table over there. These are guys from St. Louis who actually made the, uh, brought the link back to life and uh, they'll tell you their story second. So we're going to do this first. Now let's see, let me name these people and I'll start over here. This is Jerry Cox. The third section is everybody can go into the exhibit hall and meet the link. Uh, yeah, it's uh, sitting over there. Is it, is it running, guys? Yeah. You left running? Okay. More or less running, home and left. <laughs> That's Gerald. He always has a more or less to it. Uh, okay, well, uh, let's see. Let's start again here. This is Jerry Cox from Washington University. Mary Allen Wilkes, who was, had joined us at, uh, at Lincoln Lab and is a lawyer now. Wes Clark the principal designer of the uh, link and, and I think the rest of us as I say we're not secondary designers we just did what he told us. Uh, Gerald Johns over there then Maury Pepper, Scott Robinson and Tom Chaney. Scott it was by the way who uh, put the uh, had the foresight to put the links in his garage at the time they became obsolete and uh, none of us would be here today if it hadn't been for him. So. Uh, Let's see, there are a few other people here. In fact, there are a whole bunch of other people. Uh, maybe you could just uh, uh, X-link people. Uh, Howie Lewis over here, raise your hand, Howard, so people can see you. Howie was with us at Lincoln Lab and uh, stayed with the group when it moved to uh, Washington University. Uh, Warren Littlefield Mackey over here. And uh, let's see, where's Sandy? S Sandy Stewart. And uh, her daughter Tara's here. There's so many relatives here that, uh, let's see, I can't introduce all of them. Uh, I think, have I missed anybody crucial? Wes, help. Ivan, well, yeah, yeah, but he, but, but Ivan just simply applauded. He didn't, uh, I, he was, uh, he was a TX2 certainly. I mean, we, we can't go through the whole audience. I think we better quit. I'm over my time. Um, okay, Wesley, you want to take off and do your thing? I like to express myself in large transformational projects. Unfortunately, I was never able to put enough venture capital together to uh, undertake the redesign of the island of Crete, uh, which needs a lot of work, uh, has all these old buildings on it, some of them really crumbling. And so uh, over the course of my early career anyway, I, I spent some time with uh, projects of much lesser scope. Uh, as it were, and um, many of those at MIT. I suppose you're wondering how <laughs> machines designed and built back at MIT ended up in St. Louis. Uh, could I have the first slide, please? <laughs> uh, my, my, okay, oh, yes, like, uh, like the session as a whole, uh, I'm, my part is going to be divided into exactly uh, two parts. In the first part, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the early work at Lincoln Laboratory 
In the uh, second part, I'm going to talk about what happened when we moved down to uh, the MIT campus from Lincoln Laboratory after MIT had fired me for the first time for insubordination. Um, <laughs> then, uh, then the third part <laughs> will be uh, uh, after we move to St. Louis and then the fourth part will be about um, uh, some of the later years. And I guess I have to say now that, uh, as you know, there are only three kinds of people in the world, those who can count and, and those who can't. Um, <laughs> let's see. Now I want the first slide, which will be this glorious picture. Uh, yes. The, uh, the man in the middle is George Paik, who found, George Paik, who founded the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, which we all know about. Uh, Xerox Park. He was my, he would be my provost at Washington University. He and Jerry Cox, Professor Cox at Washington University, are responsible for the fact that after MIT uh, fired me for the second time for insubordination, we ended up uh, at Washington University. All right, and the man on the, on the left is, of course, Charlie Molnar. Both George Paik and Charlie Molnar are no longer with us very sadly, uh, but they are the ones responsible. Jerry will be talking more about some of that, that stuff. Now, the, the slide will show the team back at, uh, MIT, at the Lincoln Laboratory where I, that I had managed to put together, and this is the team that built the, the first links in 1962, 61-62. There is Severo over here on the left talking to Tom Stockybrand, who's the man who made the world's most frightening magnetic tape unit for the TX2, um, and also the prototype uh, of the magnetic tape unit for the Link. Uh, behind Severo, you see Mary Allen talking to uh, my secretary, Joe, and who later married uh, the man below her, by the way. And up at the very top, you'll see in the picture Charlie Molnar in his Air Force uniform. He was then assigned to the Air Force Research uh, uh, Center there at uh, uh, the fields where the Lincoln Laboratory was located. And uh, you'll see Howard Lewis in there. Yes, Howie, there you are, about two, one step over and one step down from uh, there. Oh, you have a pointer. Why don't I have a pointer? Who has the pointer? All right, you guys. Don't nobody leave this room. Scott. Scott. Hey. Oh, thank you. Can I work it? Actually, I don't really need to point at anything. I can, you know, let the slide tell the story. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, sadly enough. Uh, one picture, one guy who's not in this picture, well, two people who are not in this picture, Charlie Bolnar's sergeant assigned to him at the Air Force uh, 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 laboratories there, uh, Dave Stewart. Uh, but uh, Sandy Stewart is with us and uh, some of her family as well. Um, now, let me see. Okay, Bill Papian, the man who built the first magnetic core of memory, without which none of us would be here today probably until, well, at least we had to flounder along until we had integrated circuit memory, but in those days all we had was magnetic cores. And he's not in this picture, but we'll have a picture of him later. Now then, if you'll show the next picture, which I hate, yes, it's this Brook Brothers, Brooks Brothers pose. Its only purpose is that it shows the machine as it was in 1962 when we, I demonstrated it at, uh, at the Lincoln Laboratory. So that's its official semi-public, I guess it was an open meeting, but uh, mostly Lincoln people and uh, that was the first official presentation. The next picture, however, is a picture of Charlie during that early phase of the work, and he's, uh, oh good, he's uh, there working with parts of the link and parts, and some other parts, and there we got it designed so that, uh, uh, that they would be mountable in, in relay racks at the time, and the reason for that will be clear enough uh, in a moment. The next picture, if we can get Bruce's attention to push the button one more time. Is this coming through all right? Speak up a bit. Pick up a bit. <coughs> Tip down a bit. Speak up. Pick up. Speak up. Speak up. Here we are. Here we are. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Everybody hear that? Yes. All right. I also resonate at room frequencies, and so it's a little <laughs> awkward. Okay. The next slide, yes, this is a picture from my very orderly notebook of that period from 1961. 
uh, oh, that's the first appearance of the, uh, of, uh, of the magnetic tape unit that I had in mind, down in the lower left-hand corner there. And as you can see, it would have been quite a horror. Now the link uh, I wanted to make sure was used in biomedical research. Uh, Charlie, uh, its co-designer, uh, was in fact doing his doctoral work under, uh, in a laboratory called the Communications Biophysics Laboratory at MIT where they were taking cats apart or at least studying the behavior of its uh, auditory system by sticking electrodes in and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I had built a small machine for them earlier of no great consequence, which did some averaging. Um, but the, and I wanted to make sure that the link could do that stuff. Now the next slide, the next few slides, will show pictures of the stuff from the link screen taken by Polaroid camera uh, back in 1963, 62 or 63, just at the transition of the time. Uh, well, you don't need to know that yet. The, the slide showing the cursor, well, it's that third lower left-hand slide. This whoop, one, yeah, that guy, that's a cursor that uh, a knob controlled uh, spun over the input of, it was an analog input, by the way, it had analog digital converters in it. And uh, as that, as you moved the cursor along with one knob, it traveled up and down the whatever waveform you're looking at, in this case a waveform, it didn't have been, and the number, the value, numerical value was shown on the upper left. Okay, and it made pretty good pictures. Uh, next slide. <coughs> so anyway, uh, uh, we took it down for a road show. We had a little show and tell at the a special meeting of the National Academy of uh, Sciences in Washington. And uh, thereafter, we moved it over to the laboratory uh, at the National Institutes of Health, the laboratory of Dr. Robert Livingston, um, who was then the chief of the division of um, neurology at uh, NIH. Would you show the next slide? We hooked it up, uh, Charlie hooked it up in very short order to a cat on one side, that's a mascot that they had running around the lab there, named Jasper, and the other end was connected to the analog input of the link. And, uh, and Livingston was thrilled, as you can read from the, uh, uh, the text there. If you can't read it, perhaps I should for you. No, you can read all that. Uh, he, was a, he, was, uh, he was dazzled, and so was NIH. Uh, and uh, so they offered to put a lot of money into, uh, into uh, the operation, and uh, so uh, uh, Lincoln Laboratory uh, fired me. Um, they, didn't want any, uh, they didn't want any National Institutes of Health money, it was all defense, so they said, uh, they said sorry, uh, you'll have to find somewhere else. So then we moved down to uh, the next slide, uh, is I guess this partitioning? Yes. Whoop. Oh, summer two. There we go. There's Howard Lewis. Uh, we wired together some frames. Ah, what happened was NIH, uh, when we ended up back at MIT, after they'd had second thoughts after a few months of very dismal time for us, uh, we settled back at a, a nature food center building in Kendall Square. Yep. And uh, we put that stuff together frame by frame, had them wired up. There you are. Keep going now, because we're going to move right along rapidly, says the man with the hook. And uh, you can just go to the next slide. There's a slide of Charlie. Uh, no, that's a back up one notch, please. That's what, there's the Charlie of the scope helping you check out some wiring. Next slide. Some visiting scientists came with a, a, an, evalu an evaluation committee had been set up by the National Institutes of Health. And the idea is we'd build a dozen or so of these machines and send them around to the labs around the country. Uh, in uh, interested in biology and medicine, and they would try it out for a while. So we, the next three slides, you see these people, people from our visiting team during that summer of 1963, uh, putting things together, and there you have it. Okay, so that was that piece of the story. Uh, and the, finally, I guess there's one last slide showing Charlie and me uh, at the end of that summer. Well, um, NIH had put up $27 million and a seven-year grant. $27 million would be roughly, uh, I guess, uh, a quarter of a billion dollars, to a billion dollars today, so it was real money. And seven years, it was unheard of. They had never done anything that big. It was done in a very big hurry. But in any case, there was a falling out, and MIT said, uh, hey, we, we can't do it your way. Uh, we have to do it our way, and I said no. And so they fired me for the second time for insubordination, and we went it out to St. Louis. Now. Um, in St. Louis, here's a picture, I think, of me with Jerry Cox. I guess I'm talking to Jerry in my office there in St. Louis. Next slide is a picture of uh, Severo and the very young Gerald Johns. Severo is uh, supervising him 
uh, to make sure they did everything uh, quite right, you know. And, uh, and the next slide is a picture of, uh, of uh, Tiger, uh, Scott. Uh, Scott Robinson, t uh, Tiger. You don't, uh, don't let him talk you into a bout of arm wrestling, by the way. Um, uh, uh, Tiger, uh, you were about the same age, weren't you? About 20 when you joined the laboratory. Well, he'll be telling us about that. Then there's a picture of um, Mich and, uh, Michelle Stuckey, who isn't in our, uh, anywhere here today, uh, who doesn't like to fly or travel. And uh, he's uh, with Howard Lewis again looking over something. And the next slide shows Charlie preparing for a lecture at the med school where he had come finally after he's completed his degree and his military service. And uh, he was preparing a lecture for the med school. Then there's a picture I treasure because even though it's of Maury, um, it's a great picture in the dark and looks good uh, showing Maury at the console of the link. Of, uh, we don't have consoles anymore, as you know. And then there's a picture of Mission and Severo checking. Oh, no, this is a picture of the of the link kit. We had put things together. I mean, we got them organized in, in kit form so that people could build their own. But it's a pretty big kit, as you can see. And you can see the various parts. And you'll see them all together if you go outside and look at it. And um, then uh, here's the last picture there is of Mission and Severo uh, checking that out. I had to make sure it was all exactly right before we let anybody buy it as a kit. We didn't sell it, but other people could. It was all public funded stuff, so it was all free. Well, we did charge them for the documentation. Okay, well then, that, then uh, there were some years later after that. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. I'll whip through this quickly. We just had to show, there, oh no, that's not the last of them. Back up, please, you went too fast. <laughs> oh, that was that badly out of order. We need to go up to, um, something called here four four can't see it yeah Let's, go ahead there we go I just wanted to just wanted to show you just wanted to show you that when you put this when you took this stuff apart and built it into a laboratory it was really crowded those labs were really full of equipment if you look around you can see the lake here's another picture of another lab there you go and yet a third one I think just so you can see the link parts. And uh, finally, there's this wonderful picture of Charlie Molnar that was taken just shortly before Ivan had persuaded him to come out and join his group at Sun Labs. And uh, we miss him a lot. And then some years after that, I accepted, uh, I accepted an award uh, for the architecture uh, on behalf of the group in a modest ceremony. And that's the end of my story. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Wesley. Oops. Microphone here. Good afternoon. I, I, I'm Mary Ellen Wilkes, as Severo said, and I think this is all terribly exciting. And these wonderful guys over here who made it all closer, Bruce. Oh, so I can hear that. These wonderful guys over here who made it all possible for us to be here today and gave us a real reason for getting back together and doing this. Um, I, I uh, am going to. Uh, focus primarily on some of the software that we developed for the link. I first joined the group in 1961 and my first principal job was simulating the link on the TX2 at Lincoln Laboratory, the TX2 being a machine of impressive size, scope, and speed. And so I we simulated the link, I simulated the link, I re-simulated the link, I simulated it again. Uh, Wesley and Charlie, of course, kept changing the design. It was all all new, everything was new. And I, my other job, aside from trying to program, simulate the TX2 to behave like a link, was to ask them lots and lots of questions about how the link was actually supposed to behave and what its, uh, what its performance characteristics were going to be. So there were various bouts of that. The only other thing I really remember about simulating the link on the TX2 was the midnight and graveyard shifts that you had to sign up for in two or three hour blocks. And uh, my, my frequent ship in the night companion at that time was Ivan Sutherland, who was doing the initial work on, on Sketchpad. So that will put this in some uh, historical context for you. And we literally passed like ships in the night at two or three in the morning as he was coming off shift and I was going on, or perhaps the other way around. Um, after the summer of 63, when we had the link evaluation program, I decided to take a year off. 
and uh, go around the world. And again, just to give you a little historical context, my last day at work that for that time around was November 22nd, uh, 1963, which was the day of John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Um, I came back just about a year later, late 64, and very much wanted to rejoin the group, but I was not, by this time they had moved to St. Louis. And I wasn't at all sure I wanted to move to St. Louis. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And, uh, but there was a big piece of the LINK project, there were other pieces too, but there was a big piece of the LINK project that had yet to be done, and that was a decent operating system. Uh, we had gotten by up to that point with, you know, basically assembly programs and some rudimentary uh, editing programs. But uh, meanwhile, the uh, memory size of the link had been expanded from 1,000 words to 2,000 words, which made a huge difference in what we could do uh, with the combination of link, scope, and tapes. And I very much wanted to work on that project. Uh, so Wesley said, no problem, you can stay home. My, my parents lived in Baltimore, and I, uh, I thought I would just stay there for a while until I decided where I was going to move and what I was going to do. Wesley said, no problem, we'll just send you a link. Could we have the first slide, please, Bruce? There is the link. <laughs> there is the link in the living room of my parents' home in Baltimore, just outside of Baltimore in the Green Spring Valley in early 19, I guess it, guess it must have arrived in early 1965. Um, that's the stairwell up to our second floor. And if, uh, if you, um, I should perhaps mention with respect to some of the other things that uh, are on the table there that strictly speaking were not actually part of the link kit. Um, and in that connection I think I need to mention that my father was a clergyman and if you look very closely, you will see a Madonna just behind the keyboard. <laughs> Can you all see that or do I need a pointer? No, all right. Um, he was very high church. And uh, we seem to be on kind of a religious theme today. Popes and clergymen and Madonnas and so forth. And next, let's have the next slide, Bruce. This is just another uh, view of the same, it's just the same set. Oh, the Madonna's even clearer in this picture, good. Uh, and the next slide is uh, my parents, uh, my father and my mother. I'm not quite sure what they're doing, but you can make up your own story. And then the, the, uh, the fourth slide in this little series, uh, that was me in 1965, uh, I guess, I guess working away. Um, and I was in Baltimore, I think, with the link at home for, I think, perhaps almost a year. I, I really don't remember, but it was several months. And uh, that is where the operating system that the link came to be known as LAP6, where that was first written, first developed, first designed, and worked on and debugged. Um, and in, uh, in that connection, uh, one of the things I did that spring was to make visits to several of the laboratories that had participated in the link evaluation program. I had a lot of ideas myself, of course, about what this operating system should look like uh, and so forth, but I wanted to go and talk to the participants to find out how they had been using the prior rather basic system that they'd had, what they used it for, what they didn't use it for, what they liked with it, et cetera, et cetera, what they didn't like. Um, and I came back with a lot of notes and some new ideas. And the, the primary focus here, which is hard to uh, relate to now perhaps, is that this was, this machine, everything about this machine, of course, was designed to be used by lay users, not by computer professionals. And all these biomedical researchers, although they were very smart and they learned to program it and they learned to do all kinds of things with it, they were still basically lay researchers. They were not computer professionals. And so the operating system also had to fit uh, in with that environment. And I'll, I will, I'm going to talk a few seconds here about what that, a little bit about what that looked like. So the driving factors in writing Lab 6 were really things like simplicity and reliability. We had the quaint notion at the time that um, software should be completely, absolutely free of bugs. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a notion that never really quite caught on, I've noticed, with my own equipment. 
Uh, but at the time, the idea that you would send out a program or a piece of equipment that had a bug in it was complete, it was unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable. So uh, and I actually think, uh, as far as I know, when LAF6 was finally released, it had no bugs in it. At least if it did, I never heard about it. But that was a very high priority. Um, Simplicity, what can a user reasonably be expected to remember? Do they have to look at a program manual all the time? What can they reasonably be expected to do to accomplish a certain task? Do they have to take six steps where one will do? Um, what kind of control do they feel they have over their environment, over the computer and the environment? Do they feel like they're in charge or do they feel like the computer is in charge? Uh, things like that. Now, as far as Lab 6 itself is concerned, I come here today from a great distance because I've been out of the computer field for, for uh, well, since 72, however long that is, 35 years, I guess. And so in order to uh, prepare for this, I actually had to go back and read a lot of stuff, including some of my own stuff. And one of the things that struck me about that material was that there were a number of similarities in the way uh, LAP6 and the link were operated by the lay user. Lumber similarities between that and the way we all use computers today, our laptops and our PCs and our apples. And I thought it might be interesting, more interesting for you if I just pointed some of those things out and, okay, <laughs> and got on with it. <laughs> um, could I have the next slide, Bruce? Uh, this is a picture of the lap scope uh, in the process of um, working. Someone's working on a manuscript. The, the lap six was normally in, it was, was built around manuscript construction. That's the whole top of the screen there. Uh, that's actually a link program, but the manuscript could be anything, any combination of characters, any kind of text, whatever you wanted. Um, and you could also, the lap six was also responsive to uh, I think it was 17 what we call meta commands. At the bottom of the screen you see an arrow, SM, graphic, comma, one. SM is save manuscript. Give it the name graphic, save it in the, on the tape on unit one. It works the same as your save as command works today on your laptops. The, um, to, to, edit the, to edit the manuscript, all you had to do was locate it at wherever you wanted to do the editing. The manuscript at the moment is located at, at the end of line 1070 or the beginning of line 1071 and you just typed in if you had, wanted to add stuff there you just typed it in if you wanted to delete stuff you hit the delete key and it deleted uh, backwards up through the text uh, the, the um, text itself was a continuous string of, of characters um, an elegant algorithm that was uh, uh, thunk up by Severo Ornstein and Michelle Stuckey in the early part of 1965. It's a little more complicated than I just uh, described. I don't have time to go into it today. There is a journal article about it in the um, proceedings of the IEEE in, I think, 19... It's on the website. It's on the DigiBarn website. Um, there were other, other meta-commands that you could execute that, op that acted very much like moving... Um, text around today, you could add a manuscript to, this would have been called the working area. Adding a manuscript was like inserting one manuscript in the, in the middle of another one. Uh, you also gave it a name, gave it a unit number where the manuscript was coming from. If uh, you had started with a clean document here, no text on it at all, add manuscript, add manuscript worked just like uh, going to a file or a folder on your computer and selecting a document and clicking open had exactly exactly the same effect. You could save a part of a manuscript by giving it line number parameters and that created a new manuscript with whatever name you gave it uh, so that that could be added into, uh, into other manuscripts at other times. Okay, okay, okay. There was an index on the tape, there were copy commands for copying files and tapes and so forth. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> happy, ber happy birthday, Lane. I'm going to get around here so I can see. He's the, one of the few of us who can still stand. Uh, <laughs> so I can see what's going on here. There's a button on the Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay, first slide. Next slide. Uh, how I met Wes and Charlie. Um, I, and a graduate student, had built a small averager out of deck parts. I wrote, I wrote a um, 
a grant application to NIH saying I wanted to build a uh, laboratory computer for the uh, auditory physiology lab of uh, Hallowell Davis. And to my astonishment, uh, the grant was awarded. And then I figured, I, well, I have to figure out some way to do this thing. And um, well, the deck module seemed like an obvious choice, but I th it was just a tiny company then up in uh, Maynard, Massachusetts. So I went up there unannounced and walked in one morning and said, I'd like to <coughs> get some uh, technical information. And they said, well, our chief engineer isn't here today, but our CEO is, and he has some time. So I went in and sat down with Ken Olson, spent most of the morning uh, telling about what I wanted to do, finding out about uh, modules, system modules. And uh, at the end, uh, Ken said, well, gee, you ought to go see Wes Clark over at Lincoln Lab. He's already done that. So that afternoon, I went over and was uh, amazed at what uh, Wes had accomplished, Wes and Charlie, and uh, immediately figured that the right thing to do was to join forces and uh, not try to do anything on my own. So that's what I did. Next slide. Um, so we built a link by remote control uh, from Boston uh, with parts coming in on airplanes and uh, putting them together in the basement of Central Institute for the Deaf, where I was employed at the time. And um, spending a lot of nights, it was great sport uh, getting a machine together and uh, very exciting. And um, I was feeling a little guilty one night and went home and said to my wife, Bobby, uh, gee, I'm sorry I'm spending so much time on this link. Maybe you'd like to go to the airport with me to pick up some parts. <laughs> and she said, no. <laughs> that would be like asking me to hold your pants while you visit your mistress. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, case we got the link built and here it is at CID. Next slide. Um, we then got a grant uh, for uh, the establishment of the biomedical computer lab at Washington University School of Medicine and the place they found for us uh, needed a little work. <laughs> this is the basement of 700 South Euclid where the biomedical computer lab and later uh, Wes and uh, his uh, colleagues uh, came. So this was not exactly a, a, a number one recruiting poster for getting the link group from MIT, but uh, we managed it and the way that happened was that uh, I learned that uh, things were not going entirely smoothly at MIT with uh, Wes and the group and suggested that George Paik, our provost, uh, might drop in. He did that, uh, said he was there uh, for them to kick his tires, and uh, lo and behold, uh, a deal was worked out and plans were laid for uh, the group coming to St. Louis. Next slide. So they did come, but it wasn't entirely smooth all the way. There were lots of uh, interesting developments. Um, I was sitting in St. Louis, uh, Wes and Charlie were uh, in uh, Cambridge. Uh, they were supposed to be writing a grant application. I got nervous about that and unannounced flew up there and walked into their office and found them arguing about whether 2047 was a prime number or not. <laughs> and so the origination of the prime number drop, which is a f a very advanced form of the pigeon drop, which you may know about from uh, uh, confidence games. The way that worked was that uh, uh, Charlie said that uh, it was not prime. Wes said, well, what are the factors? He started dividing primes in, and I got terribly frustrated and said, you guys get busy on the grant. I'm going to go in the room next door, and I'll finish dividing the numbers in. So I finished dividing all the numbers up to the square root of 2047 and came back and announced, it's prime. And at that moment, Charlie stuck out his hand saying, you want to bet? And I said, sure. 
And then it was at that instant that uh, West said, uh-oh. And it turned out that the numbers that he had divided in hadn't been quite right, and 23 was, in fact, a factor. So I claim to this day that that was a confidence game, and I was the pigeon. But I did pay off on a, a very nice dinner at a very nice restaurant in St. Louis. Next slide. Uh, Wes and I uh, were slated to teach a course uh, on computer design, and he announced uh, an announcement that surprised me that uh, the only way to teach a course in computer design is to get the students to design a computer. Well, that seemed, after he said it, to be a perfectly reasonable thing. So we allocated four weeks at the end of the course, got together some uh, deck flip chip modules, and the students uh, put together a computer. A later version of it was eventually used for radiation treatment planning. And here's Severo and I trying to help out the students uh, figure out what was wrong with the computer. Next slide. Uh, not all research projects uh, turn out glowingly. Um, we had an algorithm for uh, fetal electrocardiography and it was really slick, very, very cool algorithm. But uh, even though it worked well, it didn't really catch on uh, because there was no medical advantage to uh, knowing about the fetal electrocardiogram beyond what was already known. Uh, so that uh, hasn't really been a significant winner. But I noticed recently that uh, it's being revived and uh, maybe even uh, something will come of it today. Next slide. We also uh, did analysis of uh, the uh, adult electrocardiogram, developed an algorithm uh, called Aztec for amplitude zone time epic coding because it does look uh, like Aztec ruins in there someplace. And I think we spent almost as much time uh, figuring out the acronym as we did developing the algorithm. <laughs> Next slide. But we did uh, apply that to uh, cardiac arrhythmias in the uh, uh, coronary care unit. In fact, a new coronary care unit was opened up. We put in uh, a, a classic link. This, this is PDP-12. Uh, so earlier we had a classic link there. And on the opening, uh, the eve of the opening day, uh, the link, uh, which had been running perfectly, failed. And I was at my wit's end because there was a big celebration going on the next day and I wanted to have the link running. I called up uh, Charlie Molnar in desperation, told him the symptoms, and almost without he hesitation he said, it's got to be the memory. I couldn't figure out why that was, but I went to the machine, took the memory out, and a sheet metal screw fell out of the It turned out that uh, the workman had been in, putting in some air conditioning stuff just over the link, and dropped a sheet metal screw. Next slide. And it fell all the way down through all the parts and lodged in the memory. But uh, having fallen out after I took the memory out, when the memory was replaced, it worked just fine and everything else. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, Mary Allen uh, did a link bibliography, and here's uh, a burst of publications that occurred between 1964 and 1969, total of 151, and you can see the broad regions of biomedical research that were covered by publications that were stimulated by the link. Uh, next slide. Uh, one good example was in neurophysiology. The lab at uh, Washington U and the lab at the University of Wisconsin uh, were two prime examples of the kind of work that was going on. Uh, one good example was in neurophysiology, a lab at uh, Washington U and a lab at the University of Wisconsin um, 
were two uh, prime examples of the kind of work that was going on. Russ Pfeiffer is shown here with a cat in his lab at Washington U, and Joe Hind is shown uh, uh, from the University of Wisconsin. Um, they did uh, marvelous uh, work in auditory neurophysiology, and uh, Joe Hind uh, also uh, developed many collaborations which did important work uh, with the link. In the like, next slide. Uh, unfortunately, Joe Hind uh, passed away in 2003, and this is a snippet from uh, an old bit that was written, and I'll just uh, read that. Joe Hind's most important technical contribution was to bring to the campus the first dedicated laboratory computer. Together with his colleague Dan Geisler, he introduced the link to this campus in 1963. It revolutionized the analysis of neural responses. Not only did it speed up data analysis by more than two orders of magnitude, but it also provided rapid online feedback of processed output that would enabled hitherto impossible experiments to be carried out. Word of the link quickly spread, attack, attracting medical scientists from diverse departments to see the new computer in action. Automated clinical laboratories, analysis, and automated patient interviews were thus born on that computer. So there are many areas that were stimulated by the link computer and the researchers that used it. Thank you. Uh, Howie, it's uh, your turn. Howard's got a uh, what may be the first digital photograph to show us. Hi, I'm Howard Lewis. I was uh, privy to join the Link Group back in 1962 and stayed with them until 1981. I'm going to go a bit forward from 1962, the innovation of the Link, to a decade later in 1972, when at that time the Link was really the workhorse of all of the uh, projects and research that was going on uh, with respect to the macromolecular project that we were doing at the time. But along about that time, this gentleman here to my left, Severo Ornstein, developed Wanderlust. And he had again to visit China. And as you recall, back in 1972, that was not the thing for a single individual to, to be doing. Severo developed uh, a subterfuge where he induced a number of <laughs> computer uh, scientists to apply for a visa to make a, a tour of uh, China along with Wes Clark. As I said, that was in 1972. In 1973, one year later, the Chinese sent a delegation to the U.S. to visit our uh, the computer development organizations and universities. Bob Arnzen, who was the mechanical engineer that designed most of the hardware for our computer uh, macromodular projects, and a novice computer nerd, I might add, wanted to make sure that our Chinese delegation uh, had some memento of St. Louis that they could take back to China and remember their visit to our great city. So he took his Nikon, went down to the city of St. Louis and shot the city hall with a newly erected arch in the background reflecting the moonlight. He hurried back to the, to the laboratory and quickly scanned the negative into the link uh, with a densiometer that uh, put output from zero to eight, zero to seven actually with zero representing black, the shades of gray uh, up to white, uh, signified by the number seven. Uh, our photography group, uh, Gary Parker and David Shoup, then got a huge substrate, pasted uh, corresponding shades of gray, black and white, in the corresponding places as dictated by the link. 
Later, that large substrate was photographed and reduced by a factor of four and produced the image that we can see. <laughs> so I like to claim that the link was one of the first to produce digital photography, although it was a little subterfuge used. But uh, this represented quite an effort by everybody in the office. I think every employee from secretaries to drivers to whoever was there dropped by at one time or another to paste a couple of squares onto the substrate. So, <laughs> I thank you. Okay, now we're going to switch gears and start talking about the resurrection of the machine and uh, let's see the next slide. Oh, there it is. Uh, everything in uh, Silicon Valley, I know, starts in a garage, and in this instance, uh, the uh, link was stored for like 25 years, I think, in, uh, in Scott's garage. And he's going to start off and tell us why in hell he put that thing, put all that stuff in there 25 years ago. So. I'm Scott Robinson, and uh, I was hired as an electronics technician back in 67 and I had just turned 20 years old and after being uh, institutionalized all my life and uh, being, being closely watched with my parents you know uh, one day my dad gave me a phone call and he said you're supposed to meet a Norm Kinch and a uh, Professor Wesley Clark at the Computer Systems Laboratory the old Shriners Hospital and I said, what? So I got my car that I had just for one week and I went down there and I had an interview with, with uh, Norm Kinch. And uh, I met Wesley Clark and uh, they liked the cut of my jib, which I did not know what that meant at that time. <laughs> and they asked me if I would be interested in doing what I was told. And I said, that's, I'm 20 years old, and I said, that's all I've ever done. And so, to make a long story short, I became an electronics technician, and having slide number one, if you can show this, this is where I live, and that's my house, and that's a police car, by the way, that I bought. Uh, this is where I stored my uh, four links that I had acquired. I'll tell you exactly how that happened. But if I could have slide one up there, with the, which is the mainframe. This is what I was taught to do in 67. This is the hard wiring of mainframe unit, central processing unit. This is the Z box where the memory goes. And I f first started doing all of my wiring here with number 22 bus wire using Teflon tubing. And we were using Teflon tubing because we thought that maybe someday these computers would still be working back in the 80s and the 90s and the year 2000 and beyond. And uh, the foresight that uh, Wesley Clark had and uh, Charlie Molnar had was they're absolutely right because here it is, you see. Because if the wiring would not disintegrate having the normal wiring insulation, which would have been PVC, polyvinyl chloride. So the insulation would, would not break down. So everything is just as it was back then. And this is what I wish to do right here. Uh, if I could have one of the other slides, this is slide number two. Uh, this is my garage. This is where I kept everything. And uh, this, I had uh, 59 Edsel right in front of it, and they happened to be the same color as the link which is very interesting. And uh, these are all of the pieces that I had. If I had slide number uh, three, this is the shelf that I had, and I had all of these stacked up here. And, and uh, I actually had a few mice that had homes in here. <laughs> but I also had cats that roamed through there, and they would occasionally come in there. So I, I, have, I had Russian blues at the time. Interestingly enough that uh, they were not blue, but they were called Russian blues, and it's interesting how the links are blue, too, as well, incidentally. Uh, so, uh, as time went on, uh, I kept these, hoping someday that some event like this would happen. Believe it or not, 
That's exactly what I had. And when I tried to procure these links from our department, from a Fred Rosenberger, who was at the time our uh, assistant, associate, assistant director of the department, I asked him if I could have number seven, which was the link that I worked on, which is the one that we have. And he said, why in the heck would you ever want one of those links? And I said, because I don't want them to be trashed. In uh, the second floor of the uh, old Shriners Hospital, where our department was, we had four links lined up to be thrown away. And I wasn't about to have that happen because I thought that if that was to be thrown away, that that would be like throwing away Wesley and Charlie. And I so dearly love those machines uh, because, you know, I worked on the outside and the inside. Actually, no, I actually worked on the inside of the computer and not the outside, which means that I was a hardwired guy and not the programmer, okay? I also wired the dad terminal box, and I had a lot of projects in there that included uh, discrete components and hard wiring and printed circuit boards. And I got a lot of that from Dave Stewart, who started me on uh, making circuit boards and everything. And Howard Lewis over here, right here, you see, <laughs> was the first guy that uh, I really uh, came to know very well. And I went to him with all of my questions. Just, who are these people and why are they working after hours, you know, and what was all this about and everything? Well, it turned out he gave me my first uh, discrete wiring project, and I wish that I had brought that here, but it came out of the uh, semiconductor handbook. And if you remember that, Howard, late one, 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 one Friday at 3.30, and of course everybody goes home at 4.30, right? Well, uh, I wired that up, and the son of a gun actually worked. And it, it was to be plugged into the uh, data terminal box, and we went home very good, very happy. So from then on out, I did a lot of the discrete component work for the circuit boards that went into the data terminal box, which happens to be this unit right here. And uh, all of the projects that, the, that uh, these uh, engineers had would go in there, and they would, uh, all of the uh, uh, results, of course, would come out on the scope, you know, and be stored on tape and everything. That was my job. Uh, now, to tell you very briefly how I acquired these was that I went to Fred and I wanted number seven, as I was telling you. And I wanted number seven because, you know, James Bond was number seven and that was a big thing back then. And it had been in Tom Cheney's uh, uh, office, uh, home there and his little boy, was uh, Scott, was actually working on one. At, at that time, and I knew that it worked. So uh, to make a short story long, as I was talking to Fred uh, Rosenberger, uh, he was telling me that uh, there's a problem in me giving me that uh, computer because uh, it was from an NIH grant. I offered money for it, and I offered to write him a check, and he says, well, that's paperwork, you can't do that. So I, so I sat on that for about two weeks. So I went across the street over to uh, Biomedical Computer Laboratory where I talked to Stan Phillips and they were throwing three links out. So I said, okay, I said, if they'll give me three links, then why can't Fred Rosenberg give me one? So I took three links home uh, from BCL and, and uh, I also got number seven by talking to Fred about it. And he said, well, how did you get the other ones? And I said, well, I offered him three dollars apiece. He says, you paid three dollars a link for three links? And he says, yes. And he said, well, then why don't you take home number seven and we'll call it three, four for the price of three. <laughs> so I thought that was just like Kmart. So I took those home <laughs> and I kept those. And, at, at, and I had at one address, I had it in my living room for about five, six years on my coffee table. And uh, the mainframe was right next to uh, the wall there, and the cables were long enough where they they'd go right around the uh, the uh, perimeter of the house, and it didn't bother my cats at all. And so uh, I kept that there. And then I moved to another place in 1991, where from that time to uh, this day here, I, I had them stored in my garage. And uh, so I was so gl glad that I actually did that because all you guys are here, and uh, I have them, and. I have three more. Thank you.
Oh yes, these are slightly out of order, but that's all right. Is this? There we go. <clears throat> okay. Next slide is the beginning, actually. Um, do you, if you look at the display, you can see the large drawings that accompanied these uh, machines, and there were a series of uh, drawing holders uh, built in the laboratory. These are all out of plywood, and uh, they pulled the big manuals nicely, and if you go to the next one, Dan, and look carefully, um, the HCL, um, C must be computer and L must be laboratory, but what in blazes is H? <laughs> and it finally dawned on us one day that uh, it's not uh, computer laboratory, but it's uh, Howard Lewis's set of boards, and it's HCL is Howard. Howard Clifford. Howard, Howard Clifford Lewis. <laughs> Next. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, th this is uh, us moving the links out of Scott's garage into uh, my son operates, which is the guy with these back to you, the gray. I have one of these things. There it is. Yeah, this guy. Um, and uh, this is just a sequence, uh, which is kind of one of these uh, flip movie things. So, uh, Bruce, if you will just bang through those. As you bring it up, the caster's on the bottom, it wants to flip out. So you have to get your feet up on there. Go on, Scott, but there you go. Get your foot up to keep it from falling over. They're top heavy. And then just keep going. And uh, goes up the ramp, and on up the ramp, and in the door. And there's Scott sitting inside, making sure everything came out right. Um, next slide. <coughs> Uh, yes, and there it is, sitting in our space at STS Technologies, uh, putting the whole thing back together. Uh, next slide. Um, we started taking things apart, and as Scott said, uh, there were critters around. Uh, uh, in this area, it's a little bit, that is a mouse nest in the middle of the power supply, uh, which all had to be cleaned out before we could proceed. Uh, next slide. This is uh, the one of the principal switches on the leak console, and the reason I put this up is that that is a com complica complicated uh, logic device. Each of these contacts, uh, there, there are instructions in the manuals to carefully adjust the spacing of those contacts. So as as you flip the uh, lever down, that the contacts open and close in the right order. So, so when you flip that switch, you're actually doing a fairly complex set of instructions, just then moving the bat handle. Next one. Um, the, the, you'll hear a bell, uh, which is this fellow right here, <coughs> uh, which sounds at appropriate times, and also there's a speaker there, uh, which you can hear the machine running tied to a bit, and uh, if you're spending a lot of time working on one particular program and making just small changes towards the end of the development, you uh, learn to hear your program and you know uh, which loop it's running in, depending on the sound. Uh, that's all from that speaker. Uh, these capacitors were, that was the only capacitor in the machine uh, which had lost its electrolyte and uh, we had to replace that capacitor. Um, yes, next slide. Um, Yes, there's a story behind this, of course. <laughs> uh, when, when we first uh, built the link, um, the, the memory turns out that, that all of its uh, sense lines uh, were connected between minus 3 and minus 18. And this being in the early days when things were expensive, uh, you didn't put extra parts and things. So if there was nothing connected to the minus 3, it set at 0 volts. And you had to actually pass some current through it before it would move down and would measure the minus three in the power supply, which is this piece down here in the bottom, and it would measure zero volts. And of course, I was in a debug mode looking for one thing that would cause that, and I couldn't think of one thing anywhere. And it finally dawned on me that uh, the reason that the minus three was a zero volts is that a, a entire module, the memory module, was not properly plugged in. Uh, the contacts uh, take about a half a pound a piece for insertion and the memory has eight rows by 20 uh, contacts and of course you're reaching way down, down inside the machine. 
Um, so I ended up literally, this, this is obviously faked a little bit, it was kind of fun to do, but I did in fact use that eight pound hammer and I did in fact uh, use a lever bar in order to finally get the memories inserted. Next slide. <clears throat> there it is uh, down inside. The memory is right there and that's my fulcrum point and then pushing back here. Next one. Ah. Um, after we got things sort of running, uh, some people came to town. Wesley is there, and uh, I guess he's the only one from out of town. And the rest of us gathered that had been working on this. And at this point, the, the machine is sort of working from time to time. And uh, I just like that picture, so I put it in there. Uh, next. Um, there's another part of uh, machines that you really can't do in a big timeshare thing, especially if you're your shift is from, from uh, 3 to 6 in the morning, uh, and that is uh, use the machine on Saturday mornings as your babysitter. Uh, this is my 42-year-old son. When he was 6, uh, sitting at the machine, he would come in with me on the weekend and uh, play tic-tac-toe, and there was an Etch-a-Sketch program and so, several other games that he would play. Um, so we had enough machines sitting around we could do this, and one, one uh, quick story. Um, of course, I, I taught him enough uh, binary uh, math that he could set the switches himself and he had his own tape that he kept on the drawer in my desk. So we'd come in and he would grab the tape out of the drawer of my desk and disappear and go elsewhere in the laboratory and find a machine and pull one of these high chairs up and crawl up in the chair and uh, sit there and, and load his tape and play his games. And across the way there was a graduate student um, who had just joined the laboratory and uh, was trying for the first time to get his tapes loaded and get the right switches set it and hit the do talk button and hit the start 20 all in the right sequence. And he was having a terrible time. And he told me much later that that, uh, that was a real low point in his life. <laughs> when after fighting with this machine, this little kid came out, grabbed his chair, drug it across the floor, hopped up on it, and was busy playing. <laughs> so anyway. Another part of, of also uh, not just working eight to five. Uh, next slide. And of course, being, being a grandpa, uh, th this is my grandson, my son's son. Uh, Will is now 12 years old, so he's twice the age of Scott when he was in front of it. This is posed uh, recently, just before we tore the machine down. And the next slide, yes, is the two of them. This, this is my son now and my grandson. And uh, I think that's the end. I believe Gerald's next. Let's try a slide and see. Ah, oh, it is me. I don't really have that much to say. Uh, I was the one who sat in front of the machine and tried to figure out how to make it work when nothing worked. Um, when I joined the laboratory in 1964 in St. Louis, uh, the first job I was given was to write test programs for the machine. Uh, this was a great way to learn the instruction code because you had to go through every single instruction in the machine and first you had to understand what it was supposed to do before you could write a test program to see if it did it. Uh, that led to a rather thick manual. You can't see it very well in this picture, but it's uh, uh, probably an inch and a half thick, and it's mostly program listings, although it includes uh, words from Severo and other people on how to do the initial assembly of the machine. Uh, let's see the next slide. So, okay. Um, basically, uh, with, with a machine not working at all, once Tom got the power supply to apply uh, power to it, um, you would notice that uh, many of the lights didn't light. And so we pulled lights out of another machine and slowly worked through all of them. They, they just pull straight out. Um, the only way we could get a light of this sort was to cannibalize it. You can't run out and buy this kind of thing anymore. So uh, once I trusted the lights, uh, then I started to look for the, uh, the things that were supposed to drive the lights. So we started with the A register, that's the easiest one to uh, manipulate from the console. 
And sure enough, I had, uh, I thought I'd have to replace a package. There were two lights that were out. I went around the machine, peered into the cabinet, and there was no card in the slot. That was an easy one to diagnose. So uh, we actually didn't have very many bad cards. Uh, the, the typical symptom was either the card wasn't plugged in, it was the wrong card for the slot, or there was no card there at all. So once we corrected that, uh, the machine could actually run instructions uh, from the console. The, the, the do tog lever over there uh, allows you to execute any instruction in the Lynx repertoire right there from the console. Well, and I said, okay, I'll store a little program in the machine. Uh, then I discovered that the memory wasn't working at all, which led to Tom's sequence of figuring out that it wasn't just not working, it wasn't plugged in, even though it looked like it was. The memory is so large and fits in so tightly that it isn't that easy to tell if it's plugged in or not. Anyway, um, if you ever want to restore a 45-year-old computer, uh, don't think in modern terms. Think in terms of corrosion and parts that just aren't there. <coughs> um, this is a, a picture of the console as we uh, first received it. Uh, when Scott and others at BCL had packed the machine up to go to Scott's garage, they had carefully taken the black bat handles off of these expensive switches and put them probably in a paper bag to go along with the machinery. Uh, well, after 25 years, we still had the machinery, but no handles. Uh, so you can't just, again, run out to the catalog and buy some of these. So uh, next picture. A uh, combination of Jerry and Tom uh, managed to get some manufactured. It's uh, surprisingly expensive to do that for a very small quantity, like we're made, I think about 12. Anyway, they work a whole lot better than sticking your thumb on those uh, screw threads. <clears throat> and that uh, speeded things up a bit. So, uh, next picture. Um, the link, uh, as many of you know, is made out of these DEC system modules, which are this big in real life. Uh, these are germanium transistors. Luckily, as I said, uh, we didn't have any major card failures, so we didn't have to figure out how to interpolate a modern transistor and a few components into uh, a situation that was designed for a slightly different uh, technology. So anyway, that's all I have to say. If any of you uh, care about uh, playing with a really old machine, come on over to the exhibit and uh, we'll let you peer inside and touch things. Okay, Mari, what you got to say? Okay, I'll go rapidly through a few different things um, and end up with the demo. Because um, my, my part on the restoration was really not very much. Uh, Gerald and Tom had already started on it, and uh, Gerald got a hold of me when he realized he needed some of the documentation that nobody else seemed to have, and I uh, lived up to my pat pack rat uh, reputation and had a lot of stuff in my basement. Oh, my archives. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I've got, a, I've, I still do have an awful lot of the documentation and uh, was able to make some duplicates and, and get them going, uh, especially on debugging the tape drive. Um, so my part really has just been to be there to, uh, you know, heckle and, and provide documentation and uh, my, come over with my bucket of link tapes. I've got about 60 of those. And the surprising thing is that the link tapes are, uh, every one of them that I've pulled out so far that was sitting in my basement since 1974 works fine. Uh, fortunately, because some of the stuff that people thought was lost uh, was there. And uh, one, of the, one of the things we were really happy to be able to retrieve was Gerald's uh, music programs, uh, which you can come and listen to uh, uh, Bach favorite instrument, the link. <laughs> um, so moving on to um, some of the part that I played at the laboratory in St. Louis. Uh, 
I mean, I really arrived late on the scene in 67. The machine was done. The, they were all built. They were out there and they were being used by researchers. Uh, so what fell to me was, was uh, Mary Allen was totally sick and tired of, of lap six by that point. I think she actually was a, a bit nauseous when you'd mention it. Uh, and so I became the lap six librarian and was corresponding with all of the other laboratories, keeping them up to date with the tech memos and the things that were going on. Uh, and I hate to burst your bubble, but I came across a couple of bugs in the archives of letters Letters, uh, you know, some of the most obscure things, you know, like if the file name was too long and it was Thursday, you know, it would hiccup. And uh, but I you when I needed you. <laughs> so, yeah, there were even bugs in lap six, but we got them all out eventually. <laughs> There's some waiting to be found, I'm sure. Um, I then uh, I. I as a person who enjoys puzzles, you know, I mean, the, the link was designed, but what I got to do was to understand it, you know, and, and with people like Michelle and Severo around, uh, I could ask questions from the people who knew the answers uh, and just spend an awful lot of time digging through the um, logic diagrams until I pretty well understood it. And um, then that allowed me to be able to design the super link which was a whopping 32K of memory. Um, and um, thanks to Dick Clayton, uh, we, we had a scheme for addressing uh, the additional memory in uh, 1K banks with, with what were called the upper and lower uh, memory bank registers that got added on. So I wish I'd dug out the picture, I don't have it, but there is a picture of another, an additional six foot cabinet sitting next to the Lynx cabinet with 12 fans in the doors uh, to keep it cool, uh, with eight of the Fabritech 4K memory stacks. Each one costs $5,000, so $40,000 for the computer and $40,000 for 32K of memory. Uh, and there was only one of those. Uh, Somebody else in, at Duke University built another one, but I don't think they ever got it loaded up with that much memory. Uh, but that, that was fun. That, that's the kind of stuff that, that made it a real pleasure to work at a place like that. Um, I got to work with uh, Charlie Molnar and, and, and a picture you saw earlier, Russ Pfeiffer in, the cat, in his laboratory with the cats. Uh, the real work that was going on there was uh, trying to understand the auditory nerves and I got to write a program for them that was an auditory nerve simulation. And uh, I could, I've got the program, I couldn't get it, I couldn't figure out how to run it. <laughs> I didn't have any documentation, I guess, or the, the, none that I kept. But uh, I mean, what we have to show now is an awful lot of demos, you know, things that play music or play games. But there was a lot of serious work going on and being able to write things like an auditory nerve simulation program for someone who was really making good use out of it was a pleasure. Um, oh, <laughs> Howard reminded me of, of uh, something that, that happened to me and, and uh, several others I found out uh, sitting at the link and uh, start hearing a funny noise and then smoke starts coming out of the console. Well, it turns out that Almost every beginner uh, got to experience uh, Howard and Dave Lewis sitting uh, off in a, in a remote area with a long hollow tube and they would blow smoke <laughs> up into the back of the console. <laughs> and, and what they did it for was so they could watch the reaction. <laughs> Some people would just get up and walk away and act like nothing had happened. Howard, I didn't teach you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, normally they grab their tapes and run. <laughs> and that's an interesting thing to point out. Those tapes, you know, you can relate those to floppy disks. That's really the same concept. You, uh, uh, the tapes didn't belong to the machine, they belonged to the individual. They were personal tapes, uh, which is why, in a sense, you can call this a personal computer. Uh, when you wanted to work on something, you grabbed whatever tapes out of your drawer that you wanted. Uh, went to the machine, turned it on, started using it, 
it was yours. So, and, and, and you had a keyboard and a screen, and when you typed, you saw what you typed on the screen. It was totally interactive in today's mode of, of how we compute. Um, when, when one of my professors from undergraduate school where I went in Omaha came down to St. Louis and happened to come by and I showed him what we were doing, he just couldn't get over it. I mean, this, this is the way computers should work. To him, computers were things with punch cards and punch tapes and, uh, you know, just a batch everything. It was a totally different mode of, of using the computer and you know, it didn't take long for the rest of the world to figure out that this was sort of the right way to be doing things. Um, so let's go on to the demos. I, I just brought my camcorder in one day and, and started running some of the demo and game program. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> right. This is a program that's... Uh, can you pause for a sec? There, okay, what you're seeing now is just uh, Tom Cheney uh, created a little RS-232 interface for us and I wrote a program on my laptop that will just grab the output uh, and uh, so the program is, is capable of displaying it on the screen and grabbing it and putting it into a file. That allows us now to get index listings and program listings um, and then Gerald uh, wrote another program that allows us to dump tapes because uh, we want to be able to preserve what's on these tapes. Uh, uh, you know, the we're not sure that the tapes or the tape drives will last forever, but if we can get these things uh, dumped and, and onto a modern uh, magnetic, you know, and memories and <laughs> files and, and uh, CDs and so on, we can, we can preserve a lot of this. Uh, so anyway, the, what you're watching there is just uh, the program that, that I wrote. Uh, playing the part of the Model 33 teletype that the link was originally used for, but we beefed it up to run at, uh, that one runs at 2400 baud. The original uh, link was written to dump stuff out to the ASR 33, a lot of you would be familiar with that, which ran at 110 baud. So this is about 20 times faster than the, you know, a lot more efficient. So go ahead and let that run. typing in add manuscript and then the name of the manuscript which is one of the uh, free meta programs that we had so you'll hear the tapes going now it's, it's adding from the manuscript off of one unit into the work area that's on the other unit it was a lot more efficient to use two tapes at once so that it didn't have to run up and down the tapes That's the symbol table being displayed. Or no, it was first the memory allocation being displayed and then the symbol table, and then it goes back to the manuscript. Uh, this is just demonstrating the Etch-a-Sketch program. We called it Etch. Um, but basically, two, you turn two knobs exactly the same way you do on the Etch-a-Sketch game. Uh, I have to apologize for the shaky nature of this. I was just really demonstrating what I could do with my camera to see what I could should come back and really shoot for real with a tripod and everything. Oh, this is the random number generator test. I wanted to make sure that my no random number generator was reasonably random. These are randomly placed spheres uh, of, of random sizes. Uh, that was just another test for my square root routine and the, and the random number generator. And I think, was that the last one or is there one more? Oh, the music. Uh, there's Gerald and... Well, 
we'll uh, sort of finish with that kind of fading out. Uh, when people ask how we could uh, justify, you know, writing games and, and playing music and so on, we point out this was all after hours. We pretty much lived at the laboratory. Uh, I was right across the street in the med school dormitories, and Gerald was about 10 minutes away, um, and a few others. We pretty much just made that home. We just, you know, hated to leave and go home and have to sleep, but we did it now and then. Uh, but it was a place that was a pleasure to work. I mean, it, uh, I can remember as a as a first or second year person there, I would tell people, you could offer me, there's no amount of money you could offer me to get me to go somewhere else. I mean, it, there was nothing else I would rather be doing than the work I was doing there at the time. And, um, you know, it's thanks to Wesley and Charlie and, and the most intelligent people I've ever had the opportunity to work with. And uh, the work that survived, I think, is a testimony to that. Uh, we have a little presentation to make here to uh, thank these guys. These guys did all this work over the last year in, in St. Louis, uh, gratis of course, and so thank you. We have a, uh, an award for Maury here. Thank you. And believe it or not, we have one for Tom. And one for Gerald. Um, uh, let's see, I think, sure. well, yeah, uh, Bruce, time to uh, show what it looks like. Uh, no, number two. There you go, that's, uh, that's one of the typical, uh, typical ones. And uh, now Wesley has uh, his own award to present, ah, yes. wherever it is. Oh, he needs this. I need that. Bye, fellas. Okay. Yes. I think Unifocals will do it. Um, <clears throat> Scott, Tiger, you're the man who made this all possible. And uh, a number of us got together, we, we chipped in, and uh, we were trying to make you whole on your investment uh, back in 19-whatever it was. Oh yeah, we make you good on your investment back in 19 and something. And, uh, 85. 85, right. And, but you, you got four for three, you say? Yes. Well, okay, good deal, good deal. Now, um, uh, Ignore the, I mean, the, this is without value, you understand, it's beyond value, okay? And uh, so we've actually given you, uh, you brought out two machines and uh, we're giving you a four for two. And after looking around at great, uh, We, we found, uh, we found uh, you know, those bills are out of circulation when we have this new currency reform, but nonetheless, uh, we managed to find these, and uh, Severo uh, had a friend in Boston help with that, and um, here it is, and the, I'll read the inscription, and we've signed it, a number of us. The inscription says, um, in the matter of agreed balance due on assorted fiscal accounts re uh, relating to the foresight of Mr. Scott Robinson in archiving several vehicle displacing computers and to his incalculable help in bringing to life one of their best. There. And in between that, which is the cutting, the annual tradition, we have the cutting of the birthday cake for the link. 
And uh, so uh, with that, uh, questions in the audience? Because I can pass this mic. Uh, actually, if you come up here, it's a lot easier. <coughs> come right up here, and then Alan can catch you on camera, too. Just a quick question. How much power did it take to have in your living room? Was that a feasible thing to do? Did it affect your... Just an ordinary wall plug. The link was designed to operate in very ordinary environments. No air conditioning, no special uh, electrical feeds, no special anything. And the house, that, that particular house was 150 years old and had only, I'm sure, ordinary 15-amp uh, lighting circuits. Am I wrong? It had to be 18 amps or you'd have blown all sorts of things. Well, I don't know. What, would we have to do something for that? It may have ran a little warm. It ran? In the basement. <laughs> At the fuse box. Yeah, the fuse oh, box. Oh, in the fuse box. Yeah, I suppose. I don't recall that we did anything There's special. About 18 amps, they tell me. Yeah. Paul? I don't need a mic. What was the link replaced with? Like, how did it go away? What was the link replaced with? How did it, how did it evolve? What did it evolve into? I evolved into consulting. I don't know what the link did. Uh, Wes, let me answer that. Please. Yeah. Yeah, right. Here, go. Right. Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. Okay, Dick. Dick Clayton. Oh, right. Hi there. Uh, my name is Dick Clayton, and I spent a few years at Digital. And uh, the salesman that sold all the modules to this crew, Mort Ruderman, uh, sucked me into coming to Digital and to put together a machine that he conceptualized building, which would be a Link and a PDP-8 together, it was to be called the Link 8. And Severo and Wes designed the thing, and uh, some drawings were done for it. And uh, we, we ultimately built the successor to that set of ideas. It was called the Link 8. So there were, on the order of a little less than 50, I think, links of various sorts, if, if I'm not mistaken. Classic, Classic links, so-called. And uh, another company, um, Spear, was it? Spear, Spear Computing, uh, in the Boston area, built a series of a couple, three models of Link, and I think that totaled on the order of 50, if I'm not mistaken. And there were, the Link 8 came out, and you could program it as either a PDP-8 or a Link, but it wasn't very good together. It was two completely separate processors, same memory, same I.O. stuff. Um, there were about 130 of those, and I was stuck in jury duty after the Link 8 was pretty well along and was, we were starting to ship it. Um, and I finally got to do this thing right, <laughs> uh, unlike the constraints we put on Wes and Severo. And so that was the PDP-12. And that was a machine that executed PDP, uh, executed Link code, and then I had a mode bit, and it then executed uh, PDP-8 code. And you could literally switch back and forth between them. Uh, there were a few difficulties in getting the operating system uh, sources to work smoothly and switch back and forth between programming modes and uh, that mixed up all kinds of interesting things and led to some fairly messy software work. Um, and it, just Gus Jaquendo was the guy that did a bunch of that work and it was uh, eventually called Lap6 Dial, I believe was what we called the, the, uh, the software that drove both sets of machines. And there were uh, there were about uh, 140 or so Link 8s, and I'm not positive of the number of PDP-12s there were. My recollection is uh, it's either a bit under or a bit over 1,000, but I don't remember. Uh, it, it may be as few as 600. But that's, that's what happened to that, and then the PC world overtook it, quite frankly. Um, and the standardization of I.O. And, and things became pretty heavy there. Uh, so that's my view of what happened directly after the link. Integrated circuits. Huh? Yeah, I, well, <laughs> yeah, integrated circuits made made it all change very much, and then integrated processors, whole CPUs. Just a note: uh, yesterday, uh, Len Schustek took most of this group down into the storage down below us here, and as you're walking along, they're pointing, at, oh, PDP five, you know, PDP twelve, etc., and you could tell that that the link sort of had grown into the medium because they all had the same dual tape unit in the front. It was so cool to see that, that the sort of the genetic code of the link was in all these machines. It's fantastic to see it. All the same color. 
All the same color. <laughs> Uh, another question coming, and I'm, you'll have to come up. And then we're going to slide the birthday cake in front of these guys, and we're going to do our ceremony because we're getting a little bit late here. Um, State your name. And my name is Andy Rondo, and I'm just wondering how many hertz or how many uh, calculations per how many calculations per second was the link? Very good question. <laughs> The instruction cycle time was eight microseconds. Uh, each cycle was broken up into four separate clock cycles, but um, the memory cycle time was, four, was eight microseconds. And you could do some calculations in as little as eight microseconds, but typically, if you, were, if you want to talk about calculations, an add instruction took two, two six, so 16 microseconds. Um, so it's 80 kilohertz. Uh, 80 kilohertz. <laughs> 80,000 instructions per second. Uh, Gordon, did you want to make any comments? I can bring it back. Gordon always has something to say. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to come up, or you want to do it from here? No, I, yeah, I, sorry, I don't. I was, I was glad that Dick came uh, came up because, in fact, uh, he extended the the life of the link quite a bit by and made made all the software and and user uh, code. And so, uh, I'm glad glad that part of the story got got in here. So the link just didn't stop with you know 50 machines and influencing the, those people, but. Uh, but went on uh, and and lived and so I mean as a, a lot of things I've I I still kind of claim it as the first uh, personal computer I mean we've had a lot of email back and forth on that and again it's probably not something we want to get into here because everybody here knows that the two Steves invented the personal computer but uh, but anyway just before that there was another personal computer. Uh, two years ago in this room we hosted the uh, Homebrew Computer Club 30th birthday party. A similar setup and everything, cake, whatnot, and it just struck me just hearing, especially hearing Mary Allen talk about it, you know, there you are, there's a kit and you're making these machines from a kit. It's a bigger, heavier kit. Um, and people made the machines and they, I think that the link could be moved in a station wagon, but you know, trucks, station wagons, vans. Took it back home, started to code, code when you want it. Started to put these little tapes in the mail, you know, sending it to your friends. Open source idea, and just birth of this community, this kind of homebrew community in the mid '60s, you know, 10 years before. And uh, you know, that's what got me like, oh my goodness, this was so interesting to me that this had happened. Uh, and if it was the last thing that DigiBarn ever did as a project, which it won't be, uh, this is a this is a pinnacle of uh, what I've been trying to achieve those last 20, 10 years of this project. Anybody else want to make a comment or or statement? Ivan, did you want to say anything about? No. Uh, any more questions? Oh, Gordon's back up. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I I want. I basically I just wanted to congratulate everybody for for doing all this work again. Uh, as if it, it's, you know, the museum, museum does a lot of reconstruction, and it and it is really hard work to, to and uh, very finicky to keep these going. And I, I hope the the link now will persist in a in a software state, and that we can keep it going for another few hundred years. I think that's an important thing. I'm glad glad all the I. I the nicest thing I heard, I think, was the existence of the of uh, the link tape uh, being uh, uh, being readable. Uh, very, you know, because a lot of floppies are not readable at the, this thing. And the fact fact that it, it's a testimony of the way that the uh, the redundancy, uh, the analog redundancy, was used in the on the tape. That in fact it is is readable. And so. But I think the value of that is now we can take all that and and make sure that that machine will those machines will run for well forever or until whatever. 
And uh, we actually just heard uh, a few days ago when we were setting up that the Computer History Museum recently got a huge boxes of link tapes from Germany or something. It was a big addition to the collection. So Al Casal, if you're here, uh, maybe Gordon, you can talk. Uh, we could uh, mount some of those tapes and, and not only characterize them and figure out if they're going to run and what's on them, but uh, dump them. So we ought to do that as a project uh, and get some of the, as, as they were describing, some of the serious applications that were written for the machine, not just the kind of play applications you'll see here. Get them saved for the future. I don't, uh, excuse me, but I don't know whether anybody said it, but the, uh, this machine that's in the next room is, uh, tomorrow morning is moving over to the Digimart, and that's where it's going to be its uh, final resting place. So uh, we hope to have it up and working over there uh, one year the day tomorrow. And uh, there's a link downstairs as well, so perhaps in a, a future or project we can get both of those machines running and uh, with the expertise we have assembled here. And I think with that, I think we're uh, close to th 3 o'clock or something. Uh, so what we need to do, because we actually have a, be able to show you this machine and then we have to start rolling it downstairs to the loading dock area sometime after that. And I have, I have some uh, VCF duties, notably we have an award ceremony coming up. So we've got to roll on to the cake here. If that's okay, we can. Uh, so let's um, just to uh, bring some people over. If, if some of you can help undo the uh, forks and knives and spoons, carry it over. But let's. Uh, I think let's just slide in front of Scott, if we can, and then we'll get a bunch of pictures. We'll get a bunch of pictures. And this is a lovely cake. Thank you, uh, Lucky's Grocery Store. Store. <laughs> Beautiful job. And, uh, Alan, if you can uh, get us, uh, Alan's already on the case, of course. Of course, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't just Scott's birthday here. we got to get you all around. <laughs> can you guys uh, stand in the back there behind the uh, table? And, uh, yeah, um, Wes, yeah. can you grab those people over there and get them to come and stand behind? Uh, so everybody stand back there. And, Everybody's here. Severo, where are you? There you are. Okay. So we're just going to do a wonderful. Hey, Wes, you looking? Everybody. Oh my gosh. Great lunch. Yeah, they really are. They've been very patient. Oh. There you go. <laughs> okay, it is it is lit. So we're we're of course we're are we extinguishing the flame of the link? No, we just relit it, folks. So uh, let's get a few pictures here and. Yeah, and okay, well, uh, any any uh, words? Let's see, okay. So, uh, let's grab a, a knife out of this box. Well, let's see second. how many of them are there. We have to divide them equally. <laughs> 2,047 people. Can you do the math? All you have to do is the first cut, Scott. That's right. Let somebody else That's right. First one. That's right. <laughs> And you have to blow up the cat. <laughs> Yay! Yay. Uh, right. Do we have plates or just need Okay, we have we have uh, plates somewhere there, and uh, in that bag right there. Bag, sixty plates, so you got sixty. Uh, what well, are napkins do? <coughs> but uh, thank you again. Um, this has been a, a wonderful event, and uh, Scott and others will. Serve variously served cakes, and I encourage you to go off and see the link in operation because mill over there. And with that, uh, thank you again for for coming and honoring these people and this machine.